morning and welcome back to the lecture series on narrative mode and fiction. We are uh, discussing short story in the modern and postmodern era. Today our topic of discussion is going to be Bartleby the Scrivener, a story of Wall Street by Melville. So one of Herman Melville's uh, most uh, puzzling short works is Bartleby the Scrivener uh, and it was published anonymously in 1853 in Putman's uh, monthly magazine. It was collected in his 1856 volume, The Piazza, St and the Piazza Tales. Uh, so it was collected in his 1856 volume, The Piazza Tales. Critics have labeled it as uh, one of America's greatest uh, short stories and uh, it resembles his other masterpieces such as Moby Dick, uh, Benito Sereno and uh, Billy Budd uh, in that it defies any kind of quick tidy assessment or coming to conclusion, arriving to conclusion and its uh, dense symbolic structure has been called a parable of walls uh, which is an illustration, I mean which is an illustrative uh, story of wall streets. Uh, self-imposed restrictions on the human spirit. So, uh, its dense symbolic structure has been called a parable of walls and uh, the, the symbol of wall keeps coming back in the story uh, through the name Wall Street and the wall that uh, the, the, the wall like a deadlock that uh, the protagonist Bartleby faces uh, in his office throughout, right? The Wall Street and the wall as uh, self-imposed restrictions on the human spirit. So Herman Melville's uh, work, uh, Bartleby was written at a time when his career uh, seemed to be uh, in uh, ruins and the story reflects and uh, the story reflects uh, his pessimism. The narrator uh, who uh, is a successful Wall Street lawyer hires a scrivener named Bartleby to copy the legal documents. Uh, though Bartleby is initially a hard worker, one day uh, when asked to proofread, he responds to the lawyer uh, that I would prefer not to. As time progresses in the narrative, Bartleby increasingly prefers not to do anything asked of him by his boss and eventually he dies of self-neglect, refusing offers of help while he is jailed for, for vagrancy, while he is jailed for vagrancy. So he, is, uh, he, he makes a wall around him where he is neither helping others nor seeking uh, nor seeking others help and he uh, wastes away and uh, dies eventually in, to, at the end of the story. So uh, Robert Milder describes uh, this work as unquestionably uh, the masterpiece of the short uh, masterpiece of the short fiction in the Melville Canon. So Robert Milder uh, describes it as unquestionably the masterpiece of the short fiction in the Melville canon. Uh, the narrator and the text do not explicitly uh, tell us the reason why Bartleby is uh, behaving in a certain manner and so uh, his behavior is open to the reader's interpretation. Uh, Bartleby shows classic symptoms of depression. According to many Psychoanalytic, uh, psychoanalytical readings, Bartleby shows classic uh, symptoms of depression, especially his lack of motivation in life. He is uh, an inert, passive individual and good at the work he agrees to do till he starts to uh, refuse uh, and, and uh, he, he chooses, he prefers not to, not to work and he refuses to divulge any personal information to the narrator who is also his boss. Bartleby's uh, death is consistent uh, with uh, various uh, typical symptoms of depression. 
So Bartleby has been interpreted as a psychological double for the narrator himself that criticizes uh, the sterility, impersonality and mechanical adjustments of the world which the lawyer inhabits. Until the end of the story, Bartleby's background is unknown. So other than for his dimension uh, of life as a scrivener, so the professional uh, dimension of his life, uh, the, the reader or um, the narrator who is his boss, the lawyer, have no way of knowing any other facets of Bartleby's life. Uh, so, uh, one could read uh, this story uh, in a way where uh, Bartleby is purely a figment of the narrator's imagination, the, that Bartleby is the narrator's brainchild. In fact, the narrator screens of Bartleby in uh, a corner in the office, which uh, has been interpreted as symbolizing the lawyer's compartmentalization of the unconscious forces uh, which Bartleby represents. So, through introduction of Bartleby in the story, uh, it becomes the narrator's journey from the prosaic, from the mundane, uh, to discovering, to uh, you know, uh, to, to uh, facing up to uh, uh, some aspects within himself, some unconscious forces within himself and, uh, you know, uh, discovering uh, new, uh, new uh, possibilities within himself. So, Bartleby might be uh, a kind of, uh, uh, Bartleby might stand for uh, 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 the suppressed possibilities uh, inside uh, the lawyer, the, inside the lawyer's persona, the not the, the undiscovered, unconscious uh, uh, dimensions of the lawyer himself. So, a psychoanalyst, uh, so psychoanalyst uh, Christopher Bola uh, states uh, that the main focus of the story is the narrator, uh, whose I quote, willingness to tolerate Bartleby's work stoppage is what needs to be explained. As the story proceeds, it becomes increasingly clear that the lawyer identifies with his clerk. To be sure, it is an ambivalent identification, but that only makes it all the more powerful." Unquote. Now, Bartleby's uh, employer provides a first-person narrative of his experiences working with Bartleby. He portrays himself as a kind and generous man. Once again, there is a lot of pomposity, a lot of uh, complacence and, uh, uh, you know, uh, self-congratulatory attitude in considering himself as the ideal boss uh, and, and uh, constantly wanting to help Bartleby, uh, however, in his own terms, what he considers as help may not be seen as so, no, may not be seen as such by Bartleby. So, when Bartleby's work ethic declines, the narrator allows his employment, his job to continue and uh, the narrator, the boss throughout portrays himself as a tolerant man uh, towards all his employees. Uh, we have these other two uh, employees apart from Bartleby uh, who are named uh, Turkey and Nippers. And they are confrontational in the afternoon and morning alternately. So, uh, we see that the narrator is torn between his feelings of responsibility for Bartleby and his desire to get rid of uh, the threat that Bartleby poses to uh, the office and to his reputation on the Wall Street. So, uh, Bartleby is a breakaway from the ongoings, uh, from the from the lifestyle that symptomizes the lifestyle that symbolizes uh, the Wall Street culture, right? So he is a breakaway. He is an unfit to the Wall Street uh, professional culture, right? Uh, Bartleby the Scrivener alludes to Jonathan Edwards' uh, inquiry into the freedom of the will. Uh, J. Leader. In his introduction to the complete stories of Herman Melville, com uh, comments on the similarity between Bartleby and the doctrine of philosophical uh, necessity by Joseph Priestley. 
uh, both Edwards and Priestley uh, wrote about uh, free will and determinism. So Edwards states that free will requires the will to be isolated from the moment of decision, uh, in which case uh, Bartleby's isolation from the rest of the world allows him, enables him to uh, be completely free, free in the true sense where he has no transactional relationship with the world, neither does he give, uh, you know, nor does he uh, abide by uh, commands from his, commands or demands from his boss. He has the ability to do whatever he pleases, that is the actual freedom that uh, Bartleby symbolizes. Uh, the reference to Priestley and Edwards in connection with determinism may suggest that Bartleby's uh, exceptional uh, exercise of his personal will, uh, although it leads to his wasting away and eventually to his death, uh, spares him from an externally determined fate. So, his death is something that uh, he chooses. Uh, I mean, this is going into the question of the agency of the suicidal person, a person who suicides uh, also exhibits some form of great agency where the external determinants do not function on him at the moment of suicide in, in many cases. Uh, so, uh, he works from within and he is not made to work from without. Uh, Bartleby can also be seen as an inquiry into ethics. Uh, critic uh, John Madison sees the story and uh, other Melville's works as, uh, exp you know, explorations of the changing meanings of the 19th century uh, question of prudence, the subject of prudence. The story as narrator struggles to decide whether his ethics will be governed by worldly prudence or Christian ag agape. He wants to be humane. He consciously wants to display his uh, humanitarian side. As uh, through as uh, through acts, uh, you know, such as accommodating uh, the four staffs, and especially Bartleby, each of whom have their uh, own quirks, their own oddities, eccentricities. Uh, however, his behavior conflicts with the newer pragmatic and economically based notion of prudence, uh, which is uh, rather supported by changing. Uh, legal theory. So, to, to accommodate uh, the oddities of one's uh, subordinates is a very uh, past decade uh, notion of prudence and ethics. Um, to uh, possess or, or to posit a prudence based on pragmatism and, uh, you know, uh, uh, economic uh, cognizance and uh, economic uh, uh, practicality uh, supports uh, the the current understanding of prudence and uh, ethics. So the 1850 uh, case Brown versus Kendall, uh, which happened three years before the story's publication, was important in establishing the reasonable man standard in the U.S. And this uh, man of reason keeps coming back to. Um, confront and to lure the psyche of this lawyer boss uh, in the story, the narrator uh, in the story. And uh, so, the, the reasonable man stands, uh, it uh, emphasizes the positive action that is required to avoid any sort of negligence. Bartleby's passivity has no place in a legal and economic system that increasingly sides with the reasonable and the economically uh, active, the, the uh, economically viable and the question of uh, productivity, the productive individual. Uh, and this kind of a question, question of who is reasonable, who is productive, who is economically contributing, uh, gradually shrouds uh, and, and overthrows the question of humanity. So, Bartleby's fate uh, is an innocent decline uh, that leads him to unemployment, followed by prison, uh, then starvation, 
and it, it dramatizes the effect of the new prudence on the economically inactive members of society. So, Bartleby in a way is a concept, he is a representative of uh, all such figures that uh, were not, uh, you know, that could not be included according to the new definition of prudence, those who were not economically active and, uh, active and uh, contributing to the progress of the society, they uh, might as well face the same, uh, you know, destiny as uh, Bartleby. An element of the story that leads to tragedy uh, is the failure of Bartleby and his employer to communicate with each other. There is definitely a lapse of communication uh, throughout the narrative. Uh, so, in one instance, Bartleby simply uh, stops following orders from one day. Uh, suddenly, Bartleby stops uh, following orders. Uh, from this point onward, his relying on any order or request is his, uh, you know, response to. So, from this uh, point uh, in the story and in his life, uh, Bartleby's response to any order or any request made to him is passive resistance. But the rebellious employee seems either unable or unwilling to explain what motivates this sudden rebellion, this, this sudden rebellion, this sudden passive resistance. Uh, on the other hand, we have the lawyer, his boss, who is evidently unable to comprehend uh, that Bartleby may have his own re reason, may have his own reasons to uh, defy the orders being made to him. The employer's refusal to accommodate Bartleby or his needs is what leads to Bartleby, uh, is what leads to uh, Bartleby's tragic end. So, this, this crack, uh, this lapse between what the uh, boss orders and how Bartleby cannot carry it out, cannot implement, uh, contains the uh, germ, contains the kernel of, uh, you know, the future uh, where uh, Bartleby is going to die. He uh, does not fit into the Wall Street uh, professional culture and the new notions of ethics. Uh, the setting of the story is symptomatic of emotional ghetto and there is this bustling commercial center where people stride to and from work and discuss the uh, upcoming election. In the office, the narrator erects a folding screen appropriately tinted green, the color of money to separate Bartleby who is a mundane worker from himself and he being a pompous smug attorney. There are other barriers too in the narrative, uh, in the story. Uh, there are other barriers too in the story such as the black and white walls visible from the office windows and the dead wall of the prison yard. Like I said at the beginning of this discussion, the walls, the symbol of the walls of a deadlock uh, beyond which the horizon cannot be seen. The horizon has kind of come to the individual and hemmed the individual in um, becomes very, very important and it's a recurrent, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's recurrent throughout the story. Bartleby uh, deliberately seeks out uh, in a perpetual uh, confrontation with uh, some immovable, uh, insurmountable objects. He's uh, the, the walls symbolize the insuperable situation uh, that hems him in till he dies. And it is suggestive of the unchanging task except uh, unchanging uh, task expected of a copyist, uh, of a scrivener. What happens? What becomes of the free will of a clerk? An unimaginative clerk whose work is uh, a drudgery, whose work is only a repetition where the thinking is separated from the hand, uh, the hand functions on its own, it just copies uh, day after day uh, till it loses its capacity, the person loses its capacity to uh, think uh, freely, respond freely 
and act freely. I mean, um, we think of Bartleby's, uh, you know, rebellion as a recuperation of his agency that is greatly threatened through a prosaic uh, task uh, such as that of the scrivener, of the uh, clerk, the copyist. It is ironical that uh, the walls of the prison are no more uh, pleasant than the view uh, that he had from the office or the uh, endless paper drudgery which uh, imprisoned Bartleby. So is he better or is he worse in the prison than he was uh, in uh, the lawyer's office with the kind of task and the kind of sitting position, the kind of, you know, uh, uh, office that he had uh, that that was uh, ascribed to him, assigned to him. Uh, he is, uh, you know, uh, he is uh, diminished by the endless repetitive uh, task uh, that he is uh, required to fulfill the clerical task that does not require his originality, his creativity, his in intervention. So, one could also read that Bartleby's uh, uh, comment on one fine day that I prefer not to is uh, a way of uh, reviving that part of him which uh, the, that uh, you know facet of him which is uh, which is uh, jeopardized which is uh, which is uh, almost made to die by the requirements of the wall street what does the wall street require of a scrivener such as bartleby with very limited economic uh, and cultural capital someone who is not very educated not very moneyed what is such a person reduced to by a space such as the Wall Street? Uh, the effect on Bartleby is uh, that of a misspent life, a kind of self abnegation. And uh, earlier he worked in the dead letters office, uh, in the dead letter office, uh, where, like the humans, letters are relegated to uh, flames. Uh, and so, uh, Bartleby is also like those dead letters, he is incapable of changing and uh, he uh, willingly embraces some sort of nothingness. So, the story's existential overtones uh, spotlight Bartleby as an apathetic, uh, indifferent uh, rat in an unfathomable maze as he eventually dies uh, in a cheerless cul-de-sac, walled place as a result of uh, a total emotional dysfunction that is happening inside of him. Uh, on, a, on another plane, one could, like I have already stated, one could relate the futility of Bartleby's existence uh, with Melville's personal disillusionment, personal, uh, you know, failures as a writer, um, his fiasco with the publishing world, which spurned his efforts to raise his fiction from the level of breezy, you know, travel oak to something serious such as uh, philosophical treaties. Uh, in both cases, uh, we see other copies, other writers are managing to function and even thrive uh, in stifling milieus. But uh, uh, Melville is uh, like Bartleby uh, to an extent where he is crashing, uh, his career is crashing. Uh, so, Bartleby and by extension Melville both uh, are too sensitive uh, to the oppressive forces uh, that encircle them and finally that, uh, you know, choke them, suffocate them. Because the story hinges on the actions of a narrator, of, uh, you know, a narrator with a very limited perception. The reader moves, uh, uh, you know, forward, the re reader struggles, uh, fumbles. Uh, to move forward towards a resolution to the problem that faces uh, an, uh, an employer and the dilemma that uh, faces uh, an employee such as Bartleby who refuses to work altogether. A fiercely productive worker uh, at the outset, Bartleby suddenly becomes less efficient uh, and then he becomes uh, you know, an intractable worker till he finally becomes a burden to the office routine that needs to be 
uh, somehow carried out. So the, his defiance, Bartleby's uh, defiance provokes, uh, you know, shock, uh, consternation in his colleagues as he refuses to recognize his employer's uh, authority over his own uh, free will. Uh, he is unmoved by food, drink or even the money that is offered to him and Bartleby's motives elude his uh, employer who has this uh, perception of being a very kind, uh, you know, a very uh, charitable boss. He, he, he is smug and, you know, extremely uh, condescending uh, in, in this uh, regard. And, uh, and this is also this perception about himself, uh, the lawyer's perception about himself uh, emerges uh, from uh, his, you know, immersion, steep immersion in the uh, materialistic life, in a, uh, you know, commercialistic milieu. And uh, he can only dimly ha understand uh, Bartleby's uh, dilemma. He is trying to uh, intercept the case that Bartleby is through certain very superficial understanding of Christian altruism. So, turning to the law, Bartleby's accusers feel justified, almost uh, jubilant as they chase him, as they follow him. Uh, like many makers uh, to the uh, prison to his downfall. Uh, so the lawyer is obsessed by his concern for this uh, hapless, this uh, useless, uh, asocial uh, Bartleby and he makes repeated efforts to flee to the man's uh, peculiar behavior. Uh, he even uh, tries riding about the countryside uh, in a buggy as though he is uh, on a vacation. The ploy does not end his internal absorption with Bartleby's fate. He is drawn back to the prison after his initial uh, visit and arrives shortly after Bartleby's uh, death. So he goes, visits Bartleby in the prison and then again arrives shortly after Bartleby's death and finds him already uh, cold. So this, uh, so we see the skills uh, of Melville's, uh, you know, uh, the skills uh, or as a uh, the skill as a storyteller. We see Melville's skill as a storyteller as he is able to weave significant stylistic devices into his narrative technique. Uh, at the outset, the narrator, the lawyer's uh, unimaginative and hackneyed, banal uh, kind of nature is mentioned. I would uh, quote from the story. He says, I am a man who from his youth upwards has been filled with a profound conviction that the easiest way of life is the best. Hence, though I belong to a profession proverbially energetic and nervous, even to turbulence at times, yet nothing of that sort have I ever suffered to invade my peace. I am one of those unambitious lawyers who never addresses a jury nor in any way draws down public applause, but in the cool tranquility of a snug retreat do a snug business among rich men's bonds and mortgages and title deeds." Unquote. Uh, so here we have a very unadven unadventurous character who, is, uh, who has a very hackneyed uh, state of existence. He uh, does not think differently. He uh, enjoys a monotonous life uh, with without much variation, without many too many challenges coming in. And then um, the introduction of Turkey employs an image of uh, his face, which is gaining its meridian with the sun, uh, seems to set with it to rise, culminate and decline the following day with the regularity and undiminished glory. So the mood of Turkey, another uh, employee in his office is compared with the rising and the setting of the sun, the entire trajectory of the sun uh, in, in the course of an entire day. Uh, now prophetically this image uh, foreshadows also the rise, the rapid rise and decline fall of Bartleby. 
Now, the dialogue between Turkey and the boss, the lawyer, uh, and Turkey's uh, concluding remark, I quote, we both are getting old, unquote, foreshadows the lawyer's perception that he has uh, more in common with his subordinates, with these ordinary, uh, you know, uh, scriveners and clerks working under him than he may ever realize. So, uh, there is this commonality where his uh, subordinate and him are both getting old. This is the inevitable fate for everyone, regardless of the status uh, one holds in the uh, society, the social position one enjoys. Uh, Melville introduces uh, the symbol of the plaster of Paris bust of Cicero, which serves as a, uh, you know, a, a, a marker uh, 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 which serves as a uh, marker of the uh, or or which serves as a uh, symbol of the mask of cool detachment uh, that obscures Bartleby's emotions from the rest of the office. Uh, a similar example of uh, you know his artist artistry, the author's artistry is available in his allusion to uh, a pillar of salt which particular which particularizes the uh, stodgy response of the lawyer at the head of his column of clerks so all these images are very bland very uh, you know bloodless in a sense and they suggest the depersonalized atmosphere on Wall Street, the mechanical, uh, robotic uh, dimension of life, the robotic kind of life uh, that is uh, encouraged and promoted in Wall Street uh, work culture, which is capable of reducing uh, any of these uh, workers uh, to their mental breakdown, which could pursue a worker to his mental break breakdown, which happens actually to, in the case of, which happens actually in the case of. Uh, Bartleby, the lawyer who is given, uh, who is who is uh, smug and complacent, uh, and who is also quite condes condescending, who is also quite condescending. So the lawyer who is uh, uh, given to complacence and is also quite condescending uh, notes uh, with an afo with an aphorism, uh, and I quote from the story: "Nothing so aggravates." an earnest person as a passive resistance and he compares Bartleby's, uh, you know, his, uh, he compares his futile attempts as, uh, uh, his futile attempts at uh, getting some response from uh, Bartleby or motivating Bartleby to the futile attempt of striking, uh, you know, sparks with one's knuckles against a bit of uh, Windsor soap. So, his failure to motivate uh, Bartleby to, uh, you know, get some information from Bartleby regarding his, uh, his quandary, his dilemma is compared, you know, uh, with the futile attempt of striking sparks uh, with one's knuckles against a bit of Windsor soap. So, uh, the lawyer continues his ruminations over the dilemma of what to do with a uh, a passive, uh, you know, dysfunctional character such as uh, uh, Bartleby, and he uh, voices uh, his own conceit thereby. Um, uh, he compares at one point, you know, the pallid Bartleby to the faces uh, in gala trim, uh, swan like sailing down the Mississippi of Broadway. So, uh, also in uh, some parts of the narration, the lawyers voice is wrapped in his own musings, uh, Melville is a master in portraying these inner musings, the uh, wistful state of the boss himself um, through a conversational tone. So, for example, we see that the boss is uh, thinking aloud or his thinking is uh, being documented uh, by the uh, author. The way one thinks, that is the language one can capture, 
uh, that's the language that Melville is capturing in the story. So, for example, at one point, the boss, as a way of you know musing, uh, he he's thinking inwardly, a certain unconscious air of pallid, or how shall I call it, of pallid haughtiness, say, or rather an austere reserve. So he is uh, you know revisiting the words that he uh, wants to apply for. Uh, a character, an odd character such as Bartleby, he is constantly revisiting the words, he is looking for the uh, right word to describe a case uh, that Bartleby is and that is you know the inner world, the inner psyche that is so well captured by, Bart uh, by, uh, Herman, by Herman Melville. So, the author notes a personal, uh, you know a personified feeling, a superstitious uh, knocking at the heart which halts his urge to lash out at Bartleby. So, many a times he feels like lashing out, but he also controls himself and many a times he goes to the extent of calling Bartleby as a stubborn mule and he hopes that he was gone, departed he was. Uh, I would like to quickly go through the description of Bartleby's death in the end, where uh, you know the death, like I said Bartleby could be a figment of the narrator's imagination, a part of him, a possibility in him which was hitherto uh, repressed, which was uh, you know uh, a part of his, a part of his unconscious and through facing Bartleby, through facing the dilemma that Bartleby uh, you know uh, the dilemma that Bartleby symbolizes, Bartleby represents, uh, the narrator also had uh, ha and the narrator has also, uh, you know, uh, traversed a rough journey, rough journey as a human individual from being smug, complacent uh, to, uh, you know, uh, understanding Bartleby, uh, if not entirely. Uh, he, he at least starts, uh, you know, uh, realizing that uh, material uh, goods such as food and money uh, are not going to do any good to someone like Bartleby. Bartleby's quest, Bartleby's predicament uh, are different. Uh, so, although he, he realizes that uh, uh, not uh, all questions posed by a figure like Bartleby can be answered, but all the same he starts to uh, understand the questions posed by Bartleby. In a way, he tries to make, uh, I mean, what Bartleby stands for makes more sense to the boss uh, towards the end of the story. He has some idea of why Bartleby chooses to die and the question of free will, which cannot be uh, uh, meted with uh, food, with, uh, you know, social and material uh, and worldly pleasures. So, uh, here, uh, for the description of Bartleby's death, uh, Melville writes, I quote, strangely huddled at the base of the wall, his knees drawn up and lying on his side, his head touching the cold stones, I saw the wasted Bartleby, but nothing stirred. I paused, then went close up to him, stooped over and saw that his dim eyes were open. Otherwise, he seemed profoundly sleeping. Something prompted me to touch him. I left his, I, I felt his hand, I felt his hand when a tingling shiver ran up my arm and down my spine to my feet. The round face of the grub man peered upon me now. His dinner is ready. Won't he dine today either or does he live without dining? Lives without dining, said I and close the eyes. Eh, hey, he's asleep, ain't he? With kings and counsellors, murmured I. So, towards the end, there is a reconciliation, uh, there is an answer to the question th that makes the boss chase his employee uh, to the prison, to his death. He kind of starts understanding what Bartleby is made up of. Uh, he is reconciled uh, with his own uh, suppressed unconscious, he he, reckons, he understands a part of himself which does not belong to 
the Wall Street. That could also be Bartleby. So Bartleby could be this uh, dead man who could not be accommodated, who could not be contained within the Wall Street, uh, you know, working culture. It could be a, a piece of the uh, or or a fragment of uh, the boss's own personality itself. Um, and so Bartleby, not a human but a larger concept, uh, can live without dining. Uh, he is uh, outside of the mundane coordinates of uh, he's outside of ordinariness he's dying with his eyes wide open eyes that are staring at the wider horizons reaching out to the wider horizons uh, you know uh, seek for something uh, beyond the walls the walls that uh, uh, try to constantly immure the uh, postmodern self the the external determinants that try to curb that try to tie down the postmodern self, the wide open eyes are looking for something else, somewhere else beyond what uh, the immediate, uh, you know, uh, mechanical, uh, mechanistic society has to offer. And a man who is so, uh, you know, uh, eccentric and who is so larger than life, uh, who is almost a king in his own terms, who lives by his own terms and conditions uh, can only, you know, sleep with kings and counselors. He is larger uh, than what uh, the life, the the you know, material life has to offer to him. And so, in the end, uh, the boss kind of understands uh, the predicament. It's an ethical predicament. Um, and sees that a man like Bartleby uh, is, uh, you know, uh, he only fits among kings and counselors. He is not meant to, he is not meant to uh, fit into the regular life, the repetitive life of a scrivener uh, in, a, in a space such as the Wall Street. Uh, we also need to uh, quickly look at the earlier job of uh, Bartleby. Earlier Bartleby had worked as a subordinate clerk in a dead letter office and this job uh, comprised receiving all such letters that uh, could not reach their destination. They returned unreceived from their destination and in the narrator's words, uh, dead letters. Does it not sound like dead men? Conceive a man by nature and misfortune prone to a pallid hopelessness. Can any business seem more fitted to heighten it than that of continually handling these dead letters and assorting them for the flames? For by the cartload they are annually burned. Sometimes from out of the folded paper, the pale clerk takes a ring. The banknote sent in swiftest charity. He whom it would not, uh, who, he whom it would relieve, nor eats, nor hungers anymore. Pardon for those who died despairing, hope for those who died unhoping, good tidings for those who died stifled by unrelieved calamities. On errands of life, these letters speed to death." Unquote. So, a kind of frustration that might be, you know, uh, uh, seething inside of Bartleby from his earlier job, the nature of the job as the narrator describes uh, comprises, you know, it's a dead letter office, uh, letters that ha have, you know, almost hit the dead wall, the dead end. There were no recipients or they reached after the recipient died, uh, moved to another place, navigated or uh, reached after the letter had uh, no relevance anymore. And so they keep, they come back, uh, they come back with a lot of questions, with a lot of uh, uh, hopelessness, uh, incomplete stories. And when they are piled up and burned, you know, uh, it is that kind of uh, almost, uh, uh, it's the death of the letters uh, signify the uh, death of something inside of the man working in that office. Uh, many hopes, many emotions, uh, human feelings die with these letters that were not received because a lot of investment uh, might have been made towards writing a letter, towards posting a letter, 
there are expectations attached with the letter too. So, so working in a letter office is like uh, the letter never making uh, making it to the right place to the right person. Uh, working in a place like this for long could have, uh, you know, uh, could could be associated with Badlevi's choice of the life uh, that he led uh, till before his death. His choice of, you know, withdrawing and, and almost giving up on, uh, uh, on, on any kind of mundane repetitive acts, he uh, chooses to uh, recoil, he chooses to, uh, you know, uh, kind of uh, cocoon, cocoon up and, and uh, just uh, become an unsocial self. Right. Uh, the dead wall facing Bartleby's desk uh, at the lawyer's office symbolizes this lingering depression and uh, emptiness building inside of Bartleby. And the Wall Street is unable to contain, to accommodate and understand, to crack uh, this inner vacuum, this inner, uh, you know, nothingness. Uh, the story ends with the narrator's exclamation, Ah, Bartleby, ah, humanity. With this, I'm going to end today's discussion and we will meet again with another round of discussions and another short story. Thank you.